ahead and greet somebody around you this evening. Just make them feel welcomed tonight in the house of God. The song says that if there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Put those hands together tonight. Oh, we sing and there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. us to walk that he may we may be what he would have us to be there's nothing like walking out of the will of God but if he shows you the way you know which way to go thank you Lord
How many of you believe that God is a healer? Amen. How many of you know whatever you're going through, he can heal your situation? Amen. We just praise you, Lord. We glorify you, oh God. Things 
How many believe that tonight? <laughs> Praise God. We're going to pray a little bit. We're going to pray a little bit different tonight. If you need a physical healing, I want you to put your hand up high right where you are. I want all those around these folks to lay hands on them. Come on, look around, make sure everybody has someone laying hands on them. The Bible says these signs will follow them that believe. You know, Jesus said, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And here several years ago, there was a sister who was prayed for like this every Sunday, every Wednesday night for two years. She had an incurable disease in her lungs. On a Wednesday night service, the lady next to her laid hands on her when we prayed. She knew it was gone, went to the doctor the next day. They couldn't find anything. So let's believe God together tonight. Let's pray like each of us are only one praying, and Pastor Mike's going to lead us in prayer. Praise God. Father, we praise and magnify, glorify your holy name tonight. You're the great physician. You're the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the ending, the first and the last. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, mighty Lord Jesus, mighty Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you that tonight you are who you say you are. We lift up our eyes to heaven. We know our help comes from God. Father, right now we thank you that you're healing our sicknesses. You're healing our diseases. You're taking away every single thing, God, that is not directly allowed by you in the name of Jesus Christ. Anything that the enemy is bringing against us, we are now destroying it by the faith that we have in the Son of God and what He did for us when He took the stripes upon His back on Calvary, God. And we accept it right now by faith. We believe it right now by faith. Not one weapon that's formed against us is going to be allowed at all unless you allow it, God. Now, if you allow it, God, give us faith. Give us the ability, Lord, to stand strong. Give us the ability to be who you desire us to be anyway, God. But if it ain't coming through you, Jesus, Destroy every sickness. Destroy every disease. Destroy every sin. Destroy everything that will come against us. And we give you all the glory. And we thank you, God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everyone that loves the Lord, shout it. Amen. I believe your
Almighty God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank Pastor Nicole and the praise team and the musicians. I'll give them a big hand for being here on Wednesday nights with us. Turn around, greet four or five people, let them know God loves them, then you may be seated. Praise God. Just have about three or four announcements to make. They've given me here. Okay, the married couples are going bowling Saturday, March the 28th from 7 to 9. Uh, the tickets are $5 per person. You can get them at the Resource Center Sunday. There will be a mandatory ushers meeting Sunday, March the 22nd in the Koinonia, immediately following the second service for all ushers and anyone interested in becoming an usher. Water baptism is Sunday, March the 22nd, immediately following the 11 o'clock service. If you've accepted Jesus Christ and haven't been baptized yet, you need to be baptized. Baptism doesn't save anybody. If you don't know Jesus, all you do is go down as a dry center and come up a wet one. But it's an outward testimony of what Jesus Christ has done in your heart. In the Bible, no one is baptized until after they receive Jesus Christ. And, and nowhere in the Bible did they baptize babies. They tell me I was baptized with a baby. I don't remember it. But after I met Jesus Christ and I followed in an act of obedience and was baptized. Don't forget the, uh, the young adult service for those 18 to 35 this Friday at 730 in the Gene Westlake Chapel. Uh, if you give by debit card, our ushers have debit envelopes. I want to remind you we're producing a lot of literature for this the next 12 weeks. And if you give extra offering, it would help. Someone asked me tonight, they came in early. And they said, you know what we heard this week? And I said, what? They said, we heard we're supposed to give to God on the gross, not on the net. And, uh, hey, you know, that's true. That's true. If you're going to deduct your taxes, you might as well deduct your house payment, your car payment, too. Because how many know everything that comes in, any, everything that comes in, the first tenth belongs to God. And I remember, I remember years ago, they asked a well-known pastor, he was on television, if they ought to give on the gross or the net. He said, if you want a gross blessing or a net blessing. But uh, Jesus said, the, for God, but God says the first tenth is his. That's not mine to decide what to do with. It doesn't go to a televangelist. It goes to the storehouse where you go to church. They used to call me on television and say, can we send you our tithe? We don't like going on at our church. I said, no. If you're going to church, that's where your tithe belongs. Don't send it to me on television. So we have to give God uh, whatever he wants. We have some hands down here in the front one envelopes, okay, in the second, okay. And so I wanted to remind you of all that. Now read the book of Revelation. Read it like you're reading a newspaper. Don't get bogged down in it. We'll get bogged down in it here. <laughs> Just read it like a newspaper. Get the overall view. And then read Daniel the same way. Read the book of Revelation at a single sitting. Don't get up to get a drink of water. Sit down and read it at a single sitting as fast as you can read. Now, when I, took, when I was in college, we had to read Genesis 50 times in one semester. And that's 50 chapters. Each time had to be at a single sitting. We had to do the same with Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all in the same class. And that's the best way to get the overall view of the Bible. When I teach at master's level around the world, I have them read that book of the Bible as fast as they can and get the overall picture of what God is trying to say. Then go down and read it slowly and break it up. So uh, we're, we're in the book. Now, some of the handouts I gave you tonight were produced by another church. And one is that little booklet. They left the first three or four pages out of it. And I used to always give that out, but I found out people couldn't get, keep up writing as fast as I talk anyway. So, but, but we thought we'd give them to you in case you wanted them, take them home and work on them, or you can write on them here. But the first couple, three pages are missing. It was done by another church where I taught Revelation and Daniel. And so uh, we're going to be in the book of Revelation. And... Uh, Someone sent me a text today that on television, they'll try to tell you ISIS is the sixth trumpet. Uh, how would it be, the sixth trumpet or the sixth seal? It was, the sixth, uh, trumpet. it was the sixth trumpet. ISIS is the sixth trumpet. It is not the sixth trumpet in the book of Revelation. From Revelation chapter 6 has not started yet. And I'll point that out and I'll give you scriptural reasons why. People all down through history have tried to say, well, this is, this is this and this is this. Down in history, it's called the historical interpretation. And, there, and the thing is, no two people can agree with what it says. But uh, we're going to receive the tithe and offering. We'll ask our ushers to come. And we're going to receive offerings tonight. If you make out checks, Sheffield Family Life Center, SFLC. 
And by the way, you can give online at sflc.net if you're going to be away or something. Father, we're thankful again tonight we have the opportunity of giving back to you a portion of that that's yours. We offer you these gifts out of hearts of love, knowing that everything belongs to you and you make us managers. We know that you, you, you dare us to give the tithe and offering in your word. It's the only thing in your word that you dare us to do and see what you'll do. So bless your people abundantly as we offer these gifts for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. And so we, uh, let me explain while they're taking the offering. Bible prophecy is like watching a skyrocket. Bam, 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 bam. The prophets were not concerned about chronology. They were not concerned about the time gaps between events. That's true of Old Testament and New Testament prophecy. And so it takes the book of Revelation, which is the end of God's story. As I tell people all the time, without the book of Revelation, the Bible's a whodunit without knowing who done it. You don't know how the story ends. Revelation takes all prophecy and puts it together in a decent order so we can understand it and see the order of events that are going to be at the last day. We don't read into Revelation, we read out of Revelation. And so we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation. We won't be in the book of Daniel until we reach about the seventh chapter of Revelation. So you can wait a week to read the book of Daniel. And this, this is planned for 12 weeks. I'm only going to be home for 13 Wednesday nights, and I'm going to Burma, uh, which is a Buddhist military dictatorship. It's known as Myanmar. I'll be teaching a course over there in the college, and I'll be gone for three Wednesday nights. So we need to finish this by then, so I'm not going to go on and on and on and on and on. Uh, when I teach this in the college classroom, which I did in Singapore in January, I had 45 hours, 45 hours to teach Revelation and Daniel, and we're going to try to do it in 12, Okay. Try to do it in 12. So we won't interrupt the flow with questions for a few weeks. We'll let you think about it, meditate on it. And if you have questions, maybe write them out because we can take a lot of time answering questions and not get through Revelation. But I do want to be open to questions, but I have to be very careful. You know, again, because I've only got 12 or 13 weeks. I have 13 weeks at the most, but I'm planning on 12. Now, some of your handouts, the one... Uh, the one that says Israel in the last days, we, we, I won't even be looking at that for a while, but it was already on the back of the other one, uh, so we passed that out too. Now again, the Bible's uh, revelation is chapter 66 of God's story. How many like to read a book and have the last chapter missing? How did it end? You know, my wife, we'd be watching a mystery on television. My wife could go to bed with 20 minutes left and say, tell me how it ends tomorrow. I can't do that. I want to know now. I want to see it right now. And Revelation is the one that tells us how this is going to end. So we have to be very careful how we study. Let's just read the first three verses of chapter 1. Now, the name of the book is the first sentence in the book. It is not the revelation of St. John the Divine. Those titles were added in the Middle Ages. The name of the book is the first sentence in the book. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says, which God gave to him to show his servants things which must suddenly come to pass. And sent and signified it. That means to show with pictures. Sent and signified it by his messenger to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, and the things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads, they that hear the words of this prophecy. It is called a prophecy, not a history. It is a prophecy. Things that are going to happen. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And so, the name of the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, you have in your hand the 26 pictures of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. Now, I wasn't going to read this, but I understand there's people watching on the internet, so I have to read it. But you have, in the book of Revelation, there are 26 distinct pictures of Jesus. Now, let me explain some words. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word malach is the word translated angel. And yet the last book of the Bible is malachi, which means my messenger. Uh, the context has to determine whether it's a messenger or whether it's what we call an angel. In the book of Revelation, in the New Testament, the Greek word is angelos. And that's the word we get our word angel from. And unfortunately, the King James Bible always translates angelos angel. But many times it's Jesus Christ. He is the messenger of God. Paul calls Timothy his angelos, 
his messenger. And so Elijah is called a messenger of God. And so you have to look at the context to see if it's what, you have to look and see if it's really an angel or if it's a picture of Jesus. Here are the 26 pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation. He is the judge of his church, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the Amen, the beginning and the end, the firstborn from the dead, the owner of the keys of Hades and death, the faithful and true witness, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb, the high priest, the possessor of the seal of God, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the son of man, the living one, the owner of the earth and sea, the wielder of the harvest sickle. He is the son, a male of Israel. He is the trampler of the winepress of the wrath of God, the rider on the white horse, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the morning star, the light of eternity, and the primary pictures on the bottom of your page say, Go Ale. That is the Hebrew word translated in your Bible, nearest relative or kinsman redeemer. That is the primary picture of Jesus in the book of Revelation. If we miss that, we miss what of, what of, much of what Revelation is trying to show us. Now, for those of you that are not from Sheffield and don't know, I've read over 300 books in Revelation and Daniel. I wrote a textbook for Global University that's used in 80 countries of the world in Bible colleges. It's been translated into 40 different languages plus. But I've looked at all the angles, all the viewpoints, all the discussions. And so uh, uh, that's the kind of background I have when I get to the book of Revelation. So John is on the Isle of Patmos. He sees this magnificent vision of Jesus. The theme of the book is sounded in chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also that pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And John says, even so, amen, come, Lord Jesus. Come, and he is coming. Now, I've given you the outline of the book of Revelation that Jesus himself gives in chapter 1, verse 19. Chapter 1, verse 19, Jesus gives us the outline of the book. Write the thing. Uh, first of all, there's a prologue, 1 1 to 1 8, an introduction. Then write the things that you have seen, Jesus tells John. All he had seen till this time is the vision of Jesus. Can we put the outline on the screen, please? Thank you the prologue, and then write the things that you have seen. You've got a copy of it. And that's the vision of Jesus Christ in chapter 1. Secondly, the things which are. Things which are. That's the letters to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. That's chapter 2, verses 3 to... Uh, I'm sorry, 2, 1 to 3, 22. And then he says, write the things which must take place after these things. And the Greek phrase is mata tauta. Again, for our visitors, I taught New Testament Greek for 25 years, college level. Mata tauta, after these things. And, and that's chapter 4, 1 to verse 22, 6. After what things? After the things that are. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then you have the church in glory, 4, 1 to 5, 14. You have the great tribulation, 6, 1 to 19, 21. Now, I'll give you scriptural evidence for this as we go through. You have the millennium, chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. You have Gog and Magog, chapter 20, verse 7. Uh, you, and then part of it was left out. I, I, don't, I, I don't see it on the outline there either. Uh, he talks about the great white throne judgment. Chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, and then all things new, chapter 21, 1 to 22, 6, and then the postscript, be ready, be ready, and that's 22, 7 to 22, 21. Again, you have the outline, and it might have left off the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Now, let me give you principles of interpreting Bible prophecy and really all the Bible. Number one, let the Scripture interpret themselves. Let the Scriptures interpret themselves. The best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible. The best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible. Every symbol in the book of Revelation is, is explained for us somewhere in the Scripture. It's explained to us. So let the Bible be its own interpreter. Secondly, 
I want you to repeat this after me. When the obvious sense makes the best sense, any other sense is nonsense. The Bible means what it says and says what it means. You don't have to interpret it. You just have to believe it. Believe what it says. God says what he wants to say. Now, a text without a context is a pretext. Say that with me. A text without a context is a pretext. Let me explain context. If I was walking through a forest with a power saw, and I said, I want a big trunk, what kind of trunk would I be talking about? A tree trunk. If I said, I just bought a new car, and it's got a big trunk, what kind of trunk is it? It's a car trunk. What if I go to the zoo and say, I want to see a big trunk? An elephant trunk. Well, the Bible's the same way. The word means what it means in that sentence, in that paragraph, in that book. It doesn't mean five different things. There's five different Greek words. I'm sorry, there's one Greek word translated five. It, 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 I got all mixed up. There's translated flesh. It's the same Greek word, but it has five different meanings in the New Testament. Paul says the word became flesh among, and he dwelled among us. Well, what does that mean when John says that? He's talking about the humanity of Jesus. He says the works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, drugging, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murder, drunken, and partying. He's talking about attitudes and things contrary to Jesus Christ. Paul calls his religious credentials flesh in the book of Philippians. He calls legalistic do's and, do's and don'ts flesh in the book of Galatians. So context determines the meaning of the word. Secondly, we have to apply the rule of prophetic per perspective. The rule of prophetic perspective. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. I don't know if they can do it downstairs or not. I didn't mention it to them. I don't know if you can get Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 on the screen or not. If you can't, don't worry about it because I didn't warn you. Isaiah, 63, Isaiah 61, starting with the first verse and reading the next couple of verses. Now, I'm going to read from the Gospel of Luke. I'm going to read from the Gospel of Luke, but I want you to follow in Isaiah 61. And this is a principle of Bible prophecy. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now, it was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. Here's Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to announce the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, gave it again to the minister, and sat down. The eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say, This day is the scripture fulfilled in yours. Now look at the screen. Did Jesus read the whole sentence, or did he stop in the middle of a sentence? Stopped in the middle of a sentence. What's the next phrase? The day of vengeance of our God. That's still future. There's been over 2,000 years at a comma. The day of vengeance is still future. That is the nature of Bible prophecy. And if you read Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, he mentions in this day, Jerusalem will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to all the nations of the world. And he talks about Jerusalem being damaged and the victory for the Jews at Jerusalem and Jerusalem having been damaged and it's going to be damaged. And, the past, and he talks about the past victory and the future victory all mixed up. That's the nature of prophecy. Again, they weren't concerned about the time in between. They weren't concerned about the order of events. They were only concerned about the events. Uh, Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. He, he's actually quoting from the prophet Joel. He says that this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. It will come to pass in the last days. I will pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And my servants and my handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. And they will prophesy. And I will show signs in the heaven, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. That's still future from the book of Revelation. Right in the middle of a, of a sentence of prophecy. And again, that's the nature of prophecy. And that's why you get so many weird interpretations from the book of Revelation. Because if you don't understand that principle, you can make the book of Revelation say anything you want it to say. So that's why we have to let the Bible speak to us. Now understand some prophecies have a double fulfillment. Now unless the Bible gives it a double fulfillment, we can't. For instance, Daniel 9 is going to talk about what's called the abomination of desolation. 
Daniel 11 indicates that was fulfilled by a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, about 200 years before the birth of Christ. And yet Jesus in Matthew 24 indicated the abomination of desolation was still future. So that's the double fulfillment of prophecy. It's rare, though. You, you cannot just say this has a double fulfillment unless the Bible gives it double fulfillment. You all still with me? Understand the use of signs and symbols. Revelation is a picture book. It is a picture book, but these are literal events. It, it, it's actually literal events of the future portrayed as pictures. John would see, and he's told to write down what he sees and what he hears, and that's what we have in the book of Revelation. This is called apocalyptic literature. There are four apocalyptic books in your Bible. They are Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and Revelation. And these are all basically picture books. Now again, every symbol in Revelation is explained. The Bible also contains what I call parenthetical enlargements. Parenthetical enlargements. Now let me explain that. Y'all still with me? Okay, Genesis chapter 1 gives the six days of creation and God rested on the seventh day. Okay? Chap and the last thing of chapter 6, the uh, last, uh, last thing of day 6, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God made man in his image, male and female, created he them. Then you go to chapter 7, and he enlarges on one event of day 6, the creation of man and woman. He goes by the story, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then goes back and explains one event, the creation of man and woman. And by the way, you're sitting next to the crowning work of God's creation. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're the crowning work of God's creation. Male and female. Now, you might look in the mirror like I do and wonder. <laughs> but the Bible does that frequently. In Genesis, chapter, in Genesis chapter 10, he gives the table of nations where all the nations came from. And he says, in the days of Peleg was the earth divided. In other words, the continents were all once together. And by the way, science has just discovered that. If they'd have read Genesis 10, they'd have known it. Okay, the continents were once together, and they were separated, but we're not told why. When you get to chapter 11, he enlarges on it and tells us it was the Tower of Babel. That was the cause of it. So this is the nature of the Bible. Unless you read it that way, you miss a whole lot, and you get all mixed up about chronology and what things are going on. There are also picked... I actually have a chart with the different... Uh, enlargements in the book of Revelation on. Can we put that up on the screen? Uh, the parenthetical enlargements. In other words, the book of Revelation tells the story, then gives the following enlargements. All right? In chapter 7, the 144,000 of Israel and the white robe multitude. In chapter 10, the angel with the scroll. In chapter 11, verses 1 through 14, the two witnesses, who, by the way, are not Enoch and Elijah. Chapter 12, the woman, her son, and the dragon. Chapter 13 is the two wild animals. Chapter 17 is the two animals and the great prostitute. Chapter 18 is commercial Babylon. And when you get to chapter 19, of course, it's chronological order, the battle of Armageddon, when Jesus comes back as king of kings and lord of lords. Now, there are seven beatitudes in the book of Revelation. I gave you a copy of it, but I'm reading it very quickly for those that are watching on television. Blessed is he who reads, they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, and their works follow them. 14.13. See, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, keeps his clothing, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. 16.15. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage feast of the Lamb. 19.9. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, and such a second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and Christ and reign with him a thousand years. Chapter 20, verse 4. Blessed is he who keeps the sayings of this book. Uh, that's in 22, 7. Blessed are they who do his commandments. They have right to the tree of life, and they may enter in through the gates of the city. So, uh, but you have a copy of them. Now, reading again from Revelation chapter 1. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him which was, which is, and which is to come, from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the genuine witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, unto him that loves us and loosed us from our sins by his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God, and we shall reign with him. <laughs> and uh, praise God. 
He, he loosed us from our sins, past tense. Now it says he is the true witness of God. Now, how do I, I, I don't understand God. I've said this many times from this pulpit the last 42 years. I don't understand God. I can't explain God. Jesus is God in the language I can see and touch in action. He's God in the language I can hear, like father, like son. If you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. See him as he heals the sick, raises the dead, commands the demons of hell, says to the raging tempest, be still, and there's a great calm. And God says, that's my power available in your life through my son, Jesus Christ. He loved everybody. He never called a sinner a sinner, by the way. He reached out with compassion to every human being because he came to change us and set us free and make us brand new by his power. Religion's dead. Jesus is alive and well. The Bible says, he that has the Son has life, and he that doesn't have the Son does not have life. How many like me are religious till you met Jesus? I met Jesus when I was 19, but boy, I was religious before then, but I didn't know him. He changed my life. And, uh, and I say this all over the world, the devil loves religion. It's like the flu shot, stops you from getting the real thing. Stops you from meeting Jesus Christ. Again, the Bible says, he that has the Son has what? Life. life. And he that doesn't have the Son doesn't have? Life. Jesus said, I came to give you. Life. I'm the way, the truth, and the? Life. I'm the resurrection and the life. Say, he's life. It's in Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus Christ. And, and then he shouts the theme, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. I really haven't got time to go through the Alpha and Omega. My sermon on that's about an hour long that I preached here last year. And uh, the, uh, the Alpha and Omega, but that's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So in plain English, he's saying, I'm the A to the Z. I'm the alphabet. And so I, I really can't take time to go into that and explain what that is. I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation, verse 9, in the kingdom and endurance of Jesus Christ, became in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I like what he says next. He says, I became in the Spirit on the Lord's day. You know, a lot of people walk in the church. Well, here I am. Get me stirred up, song leader. Come on, get me in toes. Get me, get me involved. You got to do it. Boy, you, you go into the house of God expecting to meet with Jesus. He'll meet with you. All right? I became in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see right in the book, seven sentences of the seven churches which are in Asia, under Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice of him that spoke with me. I turned to see the voice of him that spoke with me. Now there's three words in the New Testament translated see. I'm probably giving the people the PowerPoint fits downstairs. It's PowerPoint number 14. And just put them up one at a time. All right, I want you to, I want you to learn three Greek words. Say blepo. blepo. That means to see with the eye. Okay, Mary Magdalene came to the empty tomb and she blepoed it. She saw it was empty. She ran and got Peter and John. They ran to the empty tomb and John looked in and he blepoed the empty tomb. He saw it was empty. Right now we blepo each other. Peter went in. And it says he saw the linen cloth around his head over here and the rest over here. And it said he saw, the Greek word is theoreo. Say theoreo. That's the word we get our English word theorize from. So Peter went in and saw. He said, what's going on here? Why is this here? What's happened? Has someone still? He didn't know. And then John went in and it says he hurraoed. Say hurraoed. That means to see with understanding. It says, John went in and believed. You can see that in John's gospel, all three of those. So he says he saw with understanding. Well, it says here that John turned to blepo, the voice of him that spoke, just to see. But later on it says, when I hurraoed him, I fell at his feet as though dead. People look at Jesus today in different ways. Well, he was a Jewish carpenter. Well, he was a philosopher. Well, he was a teacher. There's coming the hour when everyone is going to hurrah him and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We see him with understanding. How do you see him tonight? You can't see him with understanding if you've never met him. Okay? He comes in and he changes us and makes all things new. So... He comes along. John was in the aisle. He saw the seven candlesticks. I turned to see the voice that spoke with me being, and I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, 
clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about to perhaps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were wet like wool as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like undefined brass as if they burned in a furnace as his voice of the sound of many waters. Now the same vision Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 10, hundreds of years earlier. Daniel chapter 10. He has the clothing of a prophet, priest, and king. He has white hair indicating purity and eternity. His eyes as fire see right down into the hearts of people. His feet like brass. In the, in the Bible, brass is always a picture of judgment. He will trample his enemies underfoot at the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19. His voice, Jesus, has power and strength. His right hand concerns assistance and control. Out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. He speaks the word and it's dumb. And his face is filled with the glory of God. And so John's vision was majestic. But when I saw him, he fe I fell at his feet as though dead. And Jesus spoke. And he said this. He laid his hand upon me, said, stop being afraid. Because John became in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, the Lord's day is the technical term for Sunday. Okay, it's hey Korea ke hey mera for the Greek students. It is a technical term for the first day of the week, Sunday. You know, we get hung up on things that don't matter. Many of you know I did a live television program for 24 years, live questions and answers. And people used to call and say, well, do we have to keep the Jewish Sabbath sundown Friday to sundown Saturday? Or do we keep the Lord's Day on Sunday? I'd say yes. We're not saved by what day we keep. We're saved by who we know. We strain at gnats and swallow camels. Doesn't make any difference. Well, do we have to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or in Jesus' name only? I'd say yes. We're not saved by a formula. We're saved by a relationship. He that has the Son has life. We strain at things that aren't that important. Now, I have a reason for baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but that's not what saves people. They're saved because they met Jesus Christ. That's what makes the difference. So we get hung up on things that don't matter. We make big issues of things that the Bible teaches as minor or insignificant. And we have to be careful we don't do that. We all have to be careful. So he said, when I saw him, I fell on his feet as though dead. Stop being afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. And I became dead and I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen. That's the vision of chapter 1. The things that are the church age, Ephesus, Myrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and the things which shall be, Mata, Tau, Tau, after these things. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. So we move now into the second major area of the book, the letters to the seven churches. Now, it's amazed most books, most books on Revelation kind of pass through these. But this is the only place where Jesus gives John word-for-word -word dictation. Write this. Write this. Write this. Every other time, the Spirit of God moved on the prophets, but they spoke through their own personality. This is word-for-word -word dictation by Jesus. So, too often they're overlooked. When I teach this in the college classroom, I spend six weeks on this. If it's a 16-week semester, I spend six weeks on chapter 2 and 3. But Jesus personally speaks to the church. Now, so these messages are very vital and very critical. The letters to the seven churches you have, have here on your paper. Letters to the seven churches. Now, now, in each one there is a greeting to the angel or the messenger of each church. There is a characteristic of Jesus Christ. I walk in your midst or I have... Uh, highs of fire, what Jesus knows about each church, what he approves except Laodicea. His, he has nothing good to say about Laodicea. What he disapproves, is, except in the case of Smyrna and Philadelphia, he's not critical of either one of those churches. There is a special exhortation and or a promise. There is an instruction to hear what the Spirit says to the church. He that has an ear, let him hear. So these are also individual messages to us. And the promise to the overcomer. Now notice the next phrase on your paper. Revelation is a prophecy, not just exhortation. There were churches in these locations that had conditions that are prophecies of the entire church age. Entire church age. So I'm going to give you what each age is represented here. Now, I thought I had a great revelation when I was younger. 
And uh, I was told that we were in the Laodicean period. How many have heard that? We're in the Laodicean period. And as I read the book of Revelation, I came to the amazing conclusion that Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea will all be here when the rapture of the church takes place. And I thought, I've got a brand new truth. Woo! Wow, i got something to share with everybody. Oh, nobody's ever seen this before. Wow! And then I read Harry Ironside's book, 1923. And he said the same thing. And I probably read 50 books written 100 years before I was born that said the same thing. As you read these messages, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea will all be here when the rapture takes place, when the rapture of the church takes place. So let's look at this, what I've got down here. Ephesus is Pentecost to the end of the first century. Jesus is seen walking in this church. Smyrna, the end of the first century to 312, and I'll tell you why when we get to Smyrna. Pergamum, 312 to about 600 A.D., Thyatira, 600 A.D., and on into the tribulation. But we're going to see only part of the people in Thyatira are going to go into tribulation. Sardis, 1517, and on into the great tribulation. Philadelphia, the late 1800s to the rapture. Laodicea, the late 1800s, and on into the great tribulation. Now, what I tell people, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. Somebody saw it before you did, okay? So we read what other people have said. Now, let's look first at all, all at Ephesus. E Ephesus from the Bay of Pentecost till about 100 A.D. The word Ephesus means let go or allow. Jesus is active in this church. And he goes on to tell the church at Ephesus, I know your works, your labor, your endurance, how you can't bear them which are evil. In other words, they hate evil. You have labored for my name. You haven't fainted. It means to labor to the point of exhaustion. All right? You have, I have against you. I have against you because you have left your first love. You left your first agape. You've walked away from it. It's about like a marriage. You know, the, they get married. Ooh, want to be together all the time. And then he works late, and she has dinner fixed, and she gets mad, and he gets upset because she's mad. Why didn't you call me? All right? You've left your first love. Now, whether it's in marriage, and I did marriage counseling for many years, whether it's in marriage or relationship with God, it's easier to act yourself into new feelings than to feel yourself into new actions. What do I mean? I've had people sit and count, well, I love my husband, I'm just not in love with him anymore. Well, you, you can't wait for the feeling to start acting in love. You start doing loving things, and before long, the feeling comes back. You can act yourself into new feelings, but you can't feel yourself into new actions. Well, same way with serving God. Well, I just don't feel like reading the Bible today. I just don't feel like praying today. I just don't feel like going to church today. Nah, nah, nah. Well, start going, and before long, you'll feel like it. Start being faithful to the house of God and you'll want to go. Start reading his word and you'll want more. Start spending time in God's presence. You talk about a high. You get in the presence of God if you want a high. You start doing them before long you want to. It's the same way in marriage. Start doing the loving things you did when you met in the first place. Gene and I were still on our honeymoon after 59 years. And everyone that knows us knows that's true. Because we, we loved each other with all of our heart. And we kept it fresh. Kept it fresh for over 59 years. So praise God. The loss of love can lead to loss of relationship. Loss of love. He said, repent. Remember where you're fallen or I'll come to you and take your candlestick out of its place. And he says, he that has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit's saying to the church. But this you have, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now the Nicolaitans taught that you could live any kind of life and still be a Christian. Uh, Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, who lived from 110 to 156, he quotes Ignatius, who was killed in 108 or 115, about the impure Nicolaitans, who are lovers of pleasure and corrupters of their own flesh. John the Apostle was in a place where one of the Nicolaitans walked in, and one of his disciples said, John the Apostle ran out, said, the wicked are in the building. The wicked are in the building. So, you, you, hate, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the middle of the paradise of God. Now, what in the world is an overcomer? I've heard all kinds of definitions that there's going to be a partial rapture. He's only coming back for the overcomer. Mr. and Mrs. Super Duper Christian are going to be the only ones that make the rapture because the Bible uses the word overcomer. The Greek word nikao means to win the victory over. But what's the best interpreter of the Bible? Bible. The Bible itself. 1 John 5 verses 4 and 5 say this. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, just one click on the next thing. Who is he that overcomes the world? Watch the screen. He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The believer is the, is the overcomer, according to the Bible. If you're a believer, you're an overcomer. You have overcome the world by receiving Jesus Christ. Turn to the person next to you and say, Good evening, overcomer. Praise God. Let the Bible interpret itself. I haven't got time to tell you when I was laying on the beach in Honolulu. I turned to witness to the guy laying next to me, and he turned to witness to me. He had some kind of a story about the super Christians according to the Greek text of 1 Corinthians 12. Only the super Christians are going to make the rapture. And I apologized to him after. I really did. I said, the Greek text says that? He said, yeah. I said, come to my room. I handed him my Greek New Testament. I said, now I'm from the state of Missouri. That's the show me state. You got to show me. He said, well, I can't read that. I said, I know you can't, or you wouldn't have made that statement. <laughs> Someone that gets saved today is just as ready for the rapture of the church as Billy Graham. Amen. The thing that makes us ready is the blood of Jesus Christ, exclamation, period, and nothing else. You know, some of the Philippians thought God was finished with them. I am Mr. Perfect Christian. Paul said, I haven't yet apprehended. Now, Paul's in the Roman prison about to be executed. I haven't apprehended that for which I was apprehended of Christ. But this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and stretching to the things that are before, I press toward the mark for the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. And if you want to be perfect, be like-minded. He's not finished with you yet either. If you think he's finished with you, ask your spouse. If you still think it, ask your kids. They'll let you know he's not finished with you yet. The church at Smyrna. Smyrna. Verse 8. And the and messenger of the church at Smyrna write these things as the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Now the word Smyrna is a bitter spice. It's a word we translate myrrh. The, the, the wise men brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That was a prophecy. Gold, here is the king. Frankincense was a spice offered to deity. He's not merely human. He's also God. And he came to die because they have embalmed dead bodies in myrrh in Jesus' day. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. By the way, is there anything in the Bible that says there were three wise men? No. We three kings of Orient. That's not what the Bible says. Wealthy people did not travel across the desert by three. They traveled in huge caravans for safety. And do you think three people riding into Kansas City would create much of a stir? It was a caravan of wise men. They brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It says the whole city was moved by their arrival. All right? You have to read the book. Tradition. A city was called the beauty of Asia. Jesus had experienced death. He knows their works, their tribulation, and their poverty, but he says you're rich. You know, there's a lot of teaching going around that God wants all Christians to be wealthy financially. James says, Paul tells Timothy that that's a false teaching. False teaching. And also, the Bible in James says the poor are rich in faith. And when I go to Myanmar, Burma, in June to teach at the college there, the average pastor there makes $15 a month. You think God has one gospel for Americans and another gospel for the rest of the world? He doesn't. It sounds good. We like to hear it. I wouldn't mind if God laid a million on me. I wouldn't mind if coming. You wouldn't mind. Eh? But the Bible doesn't teach that. He says, I want your soul to prosper. What is soul prosperity? Your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. Read the book. It sounds good. God wants you rich. But there are more poor people in the world than rich people. 
I remember when I was in Togo, West Africa, the people, the day they, they make $300 a year. And the day they get paid, they bring their tithes to the church. And then on Sunday, they try to save some coins. And it was an hour-long dance as they danced up the aisle and gave God a special offering. You think God has one gospel for me and another gospel for them? He has a gospel for the whole world. I know I'm a heretic, but... They're poverty, but he says, but you're rich. You haven't got much stuff, but you're rich. And then he goes on to say, let's see. I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. I know the blasphemy of them would say they're Jews, but are not. And they're from the synagogue of Satan. Now, the Jews were the first persecutors of Christians. Read the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts. You know why? They made the law their God instead instead of God of the law. They made the law their God. Don't make the Bible your God. I heard one great American preacher say when he was younger, he loved the Bible more than he did God because of the way he was taught. This book is not God. God is God. This book points to God. This book teaches about God. But God is a whole lot bigger than what he's given us here in this book. This is just a shadow of what God is, what we have recorded here. Now, again, I love the Bible. I've told you, I've taught the whole thing college level. I've taught Greek. I've taught Hebrew. Every time I open this book, there's something new. There's something fresh because I'm a day older, and this is a living book. But this is not God. God is the person. The book is just a message of a little bit that God has to share with us. Paul says, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Then we will understand a whole lot more than we understand right now. False Jews from the synagogue of Satan. He says you'll be tested 10 days. Now, I'm not going to give you the list tonight. I can actually copy it for you. There were 10 major periods of persecution against the church during this time. Some of the Roman emperors lit their garden parties with flaming Christians. Christians were murdered by the thousands. And he goes on to say here, uh, he goes on to say, Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. The devil shall cast some of you into prison. You may be tested. You shall have tribulation 10 days. And again, there's 10 major periods of persecution during this period, and I'll make you a list of them for next week. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. You know, you're not going to tiptoe through the tulips on the way to heaven. How many have had some difficulty in your life since you've been a Christian? If you haven't, cheer up, you will. (laughs) Cheer up, you will. You know, you can be like Snoopy laying on his doghouse. Thanksgiving Day. They're in there eating pumpkin pie. And I'm eating dog food. They're in there eating cranberry sauce. And I'm eating dog food. They're in there eating mashed potatoes and sweet potatoes. And I'm eating dog food. They're going to have ice cream on their pie, and I'm eating dog food. And they're going to have took, took, took. Oh, I could have been born a turkey. (laughs) We all go through difficulties. But he says, I'll give you a crown. Now, there's a list of crowns, which, and I haven't passed out. The crown of life, Revelation 2.10. The incorruptible crown, 1 Corinthians 9.25, crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2.19, crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4.8, crown of life, James 1.12, crown of glory, 1 Peter 5.4. And then he gets to the church at Pergamum. These things says he that has the sharp sword with the two edges, from 312 to about 600 AD, and the word Pergamum means elevation or marriage. There was a high altar to Zeus, The temple of Athena was there. That was the first city to support the emperor worship. A large medical center named after Alclepus, the serpent god. A library containing over 200,000 volumes. But in the year 312 312 AD, the Roman emperor Constantine had a vision. And he saw a sign and it said, in this sign conquer, and he saw the cross. He won a great victory. He became a Christian, and I'll put that in quotes, and he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. His armies were ordered to become Christians. They were marched into waters of baptism. So it was the joining of church and state. The joining of church and state. 
In the Smyrna period, the devil tried to stamp out the church. He decided, I can't destroy the church, so I'll join it. And in the Pergamon period, Satan joined the church. If you notice the characteristic of Jesus, these things says he that has the sharp sword with two edges. Because the church was starting to preach tradition over the word of God. Contrary to the word of God. All right? Paganism was taking over. The church was becoming institutional. Institutional. Let me read it. I know your works that you dwell where Satan's seat is. You hold fast my name and has not denied my faith. In those days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, was killed among you where Satan dwells. I have a few things against you, because you have them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. Now you recall Balak the king called Balaam to prophesy against Israel. Every time he opened his mouth, he blessed them instead of cursing them. So Balaam gave him some instruction. He said, now your daughters are beautiful. You send your daughters among the men of Israel, and they will see them and fall in love with them, and your daughters can lead them into worshiping idols, and their God will kill them for you. And that's what happened. It's actually called Baal Peor in the Old Testament. And God killed thousands of Israelites because they fell into idolatry. When the northern kingdom of Israel was established, as opposed to Judah and Benjamin in the south, they had a golden calf at the north and a golden calf at the south. And and the king said, these be your gods, O Israel, that brought you out of Egypt. Immediately they turned to idolatry. You read Amos and Hosea. They accused them of spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. They said, you've turned to other lovers. And that was talking about the idols. Spiritual fornication is idolatry. One lesson the Jews have learned in 4,000 years of history, God hates idols. Say that with me. God hates idols. In 586 B.C., the northern kingdom was taken captive to Assyria because of idolatry. 586 B.C., the southern kingdom of Judah was taken captive into Babylon and Jerusalem destroyed, all because of idolatry and what it leads to. God hates idols. And in this period, they started bringing images into the church. They took the heathen images that had been in the Roman pantheon and gave them Christian names. And so, idolatry and religion started going into the church. And the state started running the church. But he says here, you also allow the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which doctrine I hate. He says, repent. Repent. Or else I come unto you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him that overcomes will I give to you the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone, a stone with a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that receives it. And so, in the New Testament, let me show you what happened. Uh, This is PowerPoint number 53. Elders, bishops, and pastors are the same person, not three people. Not three separate people, the same person in the New Testament. All I got to do is read Acts 20. Paul calls the elders from Ephesus, and he says, feed the flock of God. That's what a pastor is, a shepherd, and take the oversight. That's what a bishop is, an overseer. Peter calls himself an elder, and he's addressing the elders and telling them to oversee the church and to feed the flock of God. It's the same person in the New Testament. In the second century, bishops were put above elders. In the third century, the bishop of Rome, because that was the head of the empire, became the unofficial head of the church. In the fourth century, the bishop of Rome was called by some the successor of Peter. In the fifth century, bishops of large cities became archbishops or rulers over bishops. In the fifth century, the emperor Valentinian VI made the bishop of Rome the head of the Western church. And about 600 AD, Gregory proclaimed himself Papa or Pope of the church. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. There are saved people in every church in the world, not because of the dogma, not because of the ritual, but because they've met Jesus Christ. So I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not talking about Catholic people. I know priests that are saved and pray in the Spirit, okay? But I'm talking about a system that's contrary to the Word of God, totally contrary to the Word of God. 
And so it's the system I'm talking about, not the people. I know I had a funeral at a local Catholic church where a couple of young people had been murdered. Uh, they came here and accepted the Lord, and then they got murdered because they wanted to withdraw from the drug thing they were into. And, and because all their family was Catholic, I preached at the local Catholic church, actually had the funeral. And, of course, you know, when I preach a funeral, I give an altar call for people to meet Jesus Christ because that was full of young people that day. But after the local priest came up and said, that was good word, Brother George. Thank you. That was good word. And I've known some spirit-filled priests down through the years. They stay in the church to tell people you need to know Jesus. This wafer isn't going to save you, okay? This cup isn't going to do you any good. I better not get into that. And... Uh, and Gregory also talked the doctrine of papal infallibility. When the Pope speaks, he is infallible. He can't be argued with. He can't be disagreed with. So I say that it's obvious he wasn't married or his wife would let him know he's not infallible. <laughs> and he goes, and all the men said, amen. amen. <laughs> uh, he says, right to, and this is the only place in the book of Revelation he's called the Son of God. Why? Because adoration belongs to him alone, not to the Virgin Mary, not to any saints. Are you aware that the idea of a patron saint comes from Greek mythology? It has nothing to do with the Bible. If you go to Athens today, they have the Parthenon because Athena is the protector of the city of Athens. That's Greek mythology. It's not the Bible. There is no such thing as a patron saint. There is one mediator, the Bible says, between God and man. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. Not two, not three, not four, not five. One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. By the way, there is no office of a priest in the New Testament in the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, every believer is a priest according to the book of Revelation and 1 Peter. All of us have equal access to the presence of God through Jesus Christ. He gives us access to God. You don't need somebody else to take you into God. Jesus is the one that takes us to God and nobody else. Now, what does he disapprove? You suffer that Jezebel of a woman. That's what the Greek text says. To teach fornication, to eat things offered to idols. Again, the idol thing is increasing. And another reason he's called the Son of God. Uh, when I used to be on the radio live for 24 years with that question and answer program, a brother called me one day, or a man called me one day and said, is, well, doesn't the Bible teach that Peter is the rock of the church? No, it does not. It does not. Uh, they came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed as unto you, but my Father is in heaven. And I say unto you, and the Greek word is Petros, say Petros. You are Petros. But that is a stone, not a rock. In the Bible, you don't throw a rock, you throw a stone. He said, you are Petros. And then he changed the word. Upon this Petra, that's the bedrock of the mountain. This rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You're a stone. I'm building my house on a rock. What is the rock? It's his statement. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. That's why you're happy because flesh and blood has not revealed that to you but my Father. And 1 Corinthians says, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We are not built on Simon Peter. We're built on Jesus Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. But he disapproves Jezebel and fornication, eating meat offered to idols. I gave her space to repent. Now this is one of the passages that's over ignored by a lot of people. All right? And I have a lot of friends that think the church is going through the tribulation. I'm going to give you all the reasons next week why I'm convinced we are not for one second of it. But I have a lot of good friends that believe it. And I wrote an article for the churches in Singapore where I was there. You can disagree without being disagreeable. If somebody's disagreeable, it's obvious they're not really sure of what they believe. All right? Now, he goes on to say this. I have a few things against you, verse 20, because you suffered that Jezebel of a woman who calls herself a prophetess to teach to seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed to idols. Don't forget, Jezebel brought idolatry into Israel. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. Now listen, I will cast her into a bed and then they commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent. 
Meaning if they repent, the church is they're not going to be thrown into the great tribulation. Except they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins at hearts. I will give unto one of you according to your works. But to the rest I say in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan's, I will put nothing else on you, no other burden, but hold that fast till I come. So one group is going to be thrown into great tribulation. The other group, he says, hold that fast till I come. And it's those that have the doctrine of idolatry in that church that's going into the great tribulation. But to the rest, he says, hold fast till I come. So you have one group going into tribulation, one group holding fast till he comes. And again, these are not true Christians because they have idolatry. Are you all still with me? All right, that's just the first hint. That's only a hint so far. Hold that fast which you have till I come. He that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And the vessels of a potter shall he be broken in shivers as I received of my father. I will give him the morning star. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. You can't practice idolatry. You can't. Now, we can have an idol that's not sitting up there. An idol can be our job. An idol can be our car. An idol can be our bank account. An idol can be something we're practicing that we know God isn't pleased with. Okay, so I'm messing with you now. All right. I hate clocks. The devil invented them. Sardis, 1517, on into the Great Tribulation. 1517 was the date of the Protestant, I'm sorry, the Protestant Reformation. Now, Sardis was built on the top of a hill. It was on a plateau, 1,500 feet above the plain. And that is very significant to what he says here. So let's read this. And the angel of the church at Sardis write, These things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your name, that you have a name that you live, but you're dead. Now, many of the churches that started as a result of the Protestant Reformation, many of them no longer believe this book. No longer believe the truth of this book. Now, in many denominations, there are those that believe the book and many that do not believe the book. We need to believe what God says. I make no apologies for believing this book from cover to cover. How many believe God can give us a book to say exactly what he wants it to say? Okay. They used to call me on the TV program and say, what about the lost books of the Bible? I say, God doesn't lose things. All right. He's got here exactly what he wants here. So... They no longer, you have a name that you live. Busy, education, welfare, those are all things good. But what good does it feed a man if you don't point him to Jesus? See, we feed the homeless, you know, on Saturdays, we feed people here at the church all the time. We get a truckload from Harvest once a month, a big semi-tractor trailer, Convoy of Hope helps us feed people. We give away a lot of food, that's good. But you got to let people know about Jesus. Because whatever happens to this body, it's going to die. The soul, the real you, lives forever. So what's the sense of feeding the body if you don't feed the soul? All right. So we need to do both. You have a name that you live, but you're dead. Five commands. Keep staying awake. Cyrus captured the city by a single soldier wickering his way up in a rock and opening the gate for the armies of for the armies of Cyrus, Cyrus the Persian. They knew what he meant when he said, "Be watchful, strengthen the things that remain that are about to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God." Remember how you received. Now, what started the Reformed Church? They started believing the Bible. The Bible, sola scriptura, they called it. This is the message. Tradition doesn't count. The Word of God counts and the Word of God and nothing else. But today, many of the same churches no longer believe it. I went to a liberal seminary for one year. I won't name it. I won't name the denomination. The denomination has two seminaries. One is liberal. The other one believes the Bible. And uh, I asked the professor, why do you bother teaching this? You don't believe it. You don't believe it. He said, well... 
Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. It was written by somebody about a thousand years after Moses. I said, well, every time Jesus quoted it, he said, Moses said. They said, well, he just went along with popular opinion. I said, Jesus never went along with popular opinion. He is the truth. And was actually taught by a liberal, I won't name him, and a reformed Jewish rabbi. Now, the reformed rabbi is a Sadducee of the Bible. No, Sadducee didn't believe in resurrection, didn't believe in angels, didn't believe a whole lot of anything. That's why they were very sad, you see. All right. But it was taught by the two of them. And the professor made a statement one day, God accepts human sacrifice. Ooh, I wasn't about to let these kids in that class buy that. I was already pastoring here years ago. Again, I've been here 42 years. And I said, wait a minute. The only sacrifice he accepts is his son. You see, the whole message of the Bible is you and I, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Oh, would God just butt out, leave me alone, want to run my own life. And God calls that sin. And because he's holy, he can't pretend I didn't do that, can't pretend you didn't do that. We didn't say it, but we lived it. And because he's holy, he has to judge it. This is the message of the book. God's, God has always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There was never a time when he was not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At a point in time, God the Son became Jesus of Nazareth. 100% God, 100% man. All right? Tempted in all points like as we are, it says in the book of Hebrews, yet without sin. Lived without sin for 33 years, and God took all of your sin, all of my sin, all the sin all the way from Adam to the last person, put on his son, punished him in our place, because he loves you as if you're the only one he ever had to love. Now, I say this to congregations all over the world. I did it every day when I was in Monterey last week. I want you to say this, because some of you don't attend here. We're here. We're delighted to have you here. Say, God loves me as if I'm the only person he ever had to love. I am as important to God as anybody who has ever lived. And if I'd have been the only one that sinned, Jesus would have died just for me. That's the truth of the Bible. He, because your sin's already been forgiven, when you come to God through Jesus Christ, He forgets and forgives every sin you've ever committed, and in God's sight, He makes you holy because of the blood of Christ. In the New Testament, every Christian is a saint. You know what that means in the Greek? Holy ones were rendered holy by the blood of Christ. That's the meaning of the word translated sanctified. So, now let me get back to the cemetery, the seminary. Uh, he made the statement, God accepts human sacrifice. I argued with him. I said, only his son. He said, oh, no, he accepted Jephthah's daughter. And Jephthah's listed in the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, and Jephthah killed his daughter. I said, he did not. He did not. She didn't bewail her death. She bewailed her virginity. And the key verse is it says he, she never had sexual relationships with a man. And I said she was put into a convent-type situation because the King James says the daughters of Israel went out to lament her. The Hebrew text, and I told him, you know Hebrew better than I do, it says they went out to speak with her every year. You don't go out to speak with a dead body. And he turned to the Jewish rabbi and said, George is crazy, isn't it? The rabbi said, no, he's right. I said, yes! <laughs> they don't believe the book. They don't believe the book. He said, remember what you heard and saw. You were saved by the word. Believe the word. But you don't believe it anymore. Remember what you've seen. Hold fast and repent. Or he said, I'm going to come on you like a thief. And he uses a double negative in Greek. Now, a double negative in English is terrible. How many teachers do we have? Right, teachers? You don't say in English, I don't have no pencils. Because <laughs> what you mean, what I don't have is no pencils. <laughs> But in Greek, if you say, I don't have no pencils, that means, boy, I really don't have any pencils. Uses a double negative here. You're in no way going to know when I'm coming back. Why? Because they don't believe the book anymore. The Bible gives us birth pains, okay? Tells us when the birth pains are starting. Now, you can't know the day. I'm going to say this to close. There's people setting dates, always setting dates, they asked Jesus about the date. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? He said, it's not for you to know. And he used two Greek words, chronos and kairos. You know what those words mean? Chronos, a woman has nine months of chronos. 
and then wah, that's the kairos, all right? So he said, it's not for you to know how much time is going to pass, nor the appointed time. And if Jesus said, it's not for you to know, what does that mean? It's not for you to know. Stop wasting your money on books that set dates. It's not for, there's been so many books on dates. I'll have to bring next, next week and show you the copy that someone sent me, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture is Going to Take Place in 1988. Do you remember that book? I was on television. It's supposed to take place on Rosh Hashanah. I'm going to, I'm going to go over five minutes. It's supposed to take place on Rosh Hashanah, 1988. I got a call on the television program. Why aren't you announcing the rapture is going to take place on Rosh Hashanah? I said, I didn't know it was. They said, haven't you read the book? I said, yeah, from Genesis to Revelation. And they sent me the book. I hadn't read five pages before I wrote down five false assumptions on the cover. And uh, I actually had a big ad in the Kansas City Star the week before Rosh Hashanah. And I said, come after Rosh Hashanah, and Pastor Westlake will explain why well-meaning prophets, are, well-meaning Christians are deceived by false prophets. We're deceived by false prophets because we don't know the book. You need to hide this word in your heart. You need to leave every sentence, every chapter in its context where it is in the book, what it means in that sentence. It doesn't mean ten things. It means one thing in that sentence, in that paragraph, in that book. And you're not going to be led astray by false prophets. So again, when Jesus said it's not for you to know, what did he mean? Not for you to know. Father, we're so thankful for your love and your amazing grace. Thankful for your word that's a lamp to our feet, a light to our pathway. And your word points to Jesus. From in the beginning in Genesis 1, where he walks on every page of the promise of seed of the woman's coming to crush the head of the serpent to the last in the Bible when he stands as king of kings and lord of lords and every knee bows. I pray, Father, for my brothers and sisters. Help us to understand we're living in the closing hours of time. Help us to understand the last message of the Bible is the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that hears say, come. Let him that's thirsty come. And whosoever will, whosoever will exercise his or her will, let him come and drink of the waters of life freely. Use us for your glory to share Jesus Christ with those we come in contact with and let them know that God loves them. Help those that are here tonight to take their friends to their church that they might hear the word of God and come to know Jesus Christ. Father, I pray you'll bless and use my brothers and sisters. And I pray tonight if there's someone here that doesn't know the Lord, speak to their hearts. I wonder as every head is bowed and every eye closed, do you know Jesus? I'm not asking if you want to join Sheffield Family Life Center. We're not the way to heaven. Jesus is the only way. The Bible says, as many as receive him, he gives power to become the children of God. The Bible says, he that has the Son, again, I've already mentioned, has life. Do you know Jesus Christ? Is he living on the inside? If he's there, you know it. The Bible says we know we've passed from death unto life because he's given us of his spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. How many can honestly raise your hand and say, Pastor Westlake, I know I'm saved. Jesus Christ is living in my heart right now. Just slip your hands up and down. Now, what about those of you that couldn't raise your hand? Again, I'm not asking if you want to join this church. We're not the way to heaven. How many be honest enough to say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. I need Jesus Christ in my life. I need to know him for myself. Pray for me. Just slip your hand up and down. I need Jesus Christ in my life. A number of hands here. A number of hands. Father, I pray for those that raise their hands and those that should have. Draw them now by the power of your Holy Spirit, just because you love each one. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and give me one more minute. Pastor Mike, Randy, and Elizabeth, would you help up here? Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. I was in a service like this when I was 19, a baptized church member, didn't know Jesus. That night I stepped out of my seat and a man led me in a prayer and Jesus Christ changed my life. So if you that raise your hand or use it should have want to know Jesus, I'm just going to ask you to step out and let someone pray with you. They won't ask you to join here, even attend here. You find a good church and go to it. There's many in Kansas City. Of course, we welcome you here. But let me encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, just step out. Just step out and let, him, uh, and let someone pray with you. That's something that made you raise your hand. That's Jesus knocking at the door of your heart. I never preach anywhere in the world without giving an invitation to receive Jesus Christ. God bless you. Who else? You need Jesus. Turn to the person next to you. Say, if you want to go down and pray, I'll go with you. Go ahead. If you want to go down and pray, I'll go with you.
Praise God. Praise God. Anyone else? I never preach anywhere without an opportunity. I never knew I could know Jesus till I was 19. Recited the Apostles' Creed, sang the Lord's, uh, sang the doxology, recited the Lord's Prayer, but didn't know Jesus. Anyone else? Okay, they'll be down here to pray with you if you need someone after. Bring someone with you next week, and we'll be talking about the rapture of the church and why the church will not be here during the tribulation, if I get that far. <laughs> Somebody uh, left their, uh, tell them if they've, if they've lost their way to get their nerve.